Good morning. Thank you all uh, for coming out on, on a Tuesday morning. Uh, before I give you the cold call uh, to start this case, which is how it would start at Harvard Business School, I thought I would give you a little bit of a sense of, of where it's taught in the curriculum there. It's, it's been a very popular case since uh, Professor Tom Nicholas and I wrote it in 2012, and it's taught in a second year course called The Coming of Managerial Capitalism, which was started by a student of uh, Alfred Chandler named Tom McGraw, who then passed off the course to uh, Dick Vitor and then Richard Tedlow, and now Tom Nicholas teaches it. It's a, a survey of American business history from the earliest days of European settlement to the present. And so the first case is on George Washington and the plantation economy. The second case is on Alexander Hamilton, the man, not the musical. There's a different course that teaches that case. Um, and then this is, this is financing uh, whaling ventures. And you'll understand, I hope, a little bit more by the end of this, why it is that we teach about an industry that hasn't really been a part of the American economy for a century or so uh, as something that second year students would be, would be interested in. And I will tell you that the course is, is continually oversubscribed uh, and Tom has won numerous awards uh, for his teaching uh, and then research. So this was a fun case to write and uh, I hope that you will enjoy it. As James mentioned, I am hoping that all of you <clears throat> have done your reading and you will be willing to participate and answer some of the questions uh, as we go along. The model of the case method is that you will learn more from your peers than you ever do uh, from the professor, and I'm hopeful that that will be uh, the case here this morning. I mentioned a cold call. If you have ever worked in a bank, please raise your hand. Okay, fair, fair number here. Please keep your hands up if you ever worked in the loan division of a bank. You were a loan officer, you were originating, originating loans, all right? Sir, in the, in the blue shirt, I'm, I'm going to pick on you if that's, blue, green, blue, green. I'm going to pick on you if that's, if that's all right. It's 1850 here on Nantucket. I am a, a very good whaling captain. I'm, I'm the best. And I'd like to borrow about $30,000 and I'm going to go to the South Pacific and I'm gonna be gone about three years, but you know, time and tide and wind, you never really know when you're gonna come back. And I'd like to borrow $30,000 and I'm willing to pay you 10% interest on it. Are you in? Well, it depends on the collateral. I mean, are you, are you borrowing it against the inventory, against your vessel, against your home? What, what are you borrowing against? I, I do have a home. I don't think it's worth $30,000. I mean, real estate on Nantucket is valuable um, <laughs> in the 19th century, but but not as valuable as it is, as it is now. Um, can I ask why you're worried about the collateral? Like, I'm, I'm a really good guy. Like, we're gonna go, we're gonna get these sperm whales, we're gonna, it's gonna be great. Well, I don't know what the price of oil is gonna be in three years, but I have to find real assets to have a pledge against what could potentially be less than 30,000, so I would Yeah, wanna... but it could be so much more, too. Well, yeah, but <laughs> if that's the case, I'd be taking the equity position. That's your position. I'm taking the debt position. So, so I'm not worried are... about the upside. I'm worried about the downside. Okay, so you've mentioned one of the risks is price instability in whale oil. Right. That's definitely a concern. What are the other concerns that you have that cause you to, to want collateral? Well, I don't know if you're actually going to return with the oil. I don't know whether you're going to sell the oil somewhere else and tell me you only got half the oil that you had promised I'm, me. I'm, I'm coming back. I, I just got into sanctity. I've, I've, I've got to come back. Okay. Um. Well, that's harder than $30,000, i got to tell you. Um, well, I guess I don't have any, I assume in 1850, I don't have any way to hedge my exposure. So I don't have a forward or a futures market. Correct. All I have is your pledge that you're going to return three years later with a, a hull full of whale oil that we don't know what the price is. So would I lend it? Also depends on the prevailing interest rate in 1850, but assuming that 10% would be a generous interest rate in 1850, I would do it, but I personally, you'd probably find others who would lend unsecured, but I would personally lend to you on a secured basis. Okay. Um, and and this, is, this is about double the risk-free rate of the time, although as we know in 1850, well, 10 years later, it's not gonna be risk-free anymore. So to find a true risk-free rate in 1850 is, is problematic. Is there anybody here that does wanna make this, this loan to me? 
still looking for, for $30,000? Okay, I, I still need the money. Who has an idea for a way that I could get that money? Ma'am? Take a piece of? The upside. Okay. So I'd want to share, or whatever they call it. Yeah, yeah. I'd want to share. So you'd want to share of it's the? It's huge risk. You can't, there's no collateral, because the boat would be collateral, but the boat's going to be eaten by the whale, so the boat's never coming back. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's I a mean, nice, it's a nice trick that, on? it's a nice trick that I was playing on him. <laughs> Here's my collateral, and now I'm taking it to the South Pacific. Right, I, I don't get, so I don't know how you would collateral. I'd take a pee, I would, I would do the equity. I, I don't think I would loan on it, yeah. Yeah. Um, there are a few other risks um, that, you, that you probably uh, may not have made it to on, on page 21 of the case last night. Um, I could die, right? Obviously, in, in three cases, uh, the, the whale ship itself was, was sunk by a whale. Um, but if you look at, look at the ways that I could die, Caleb Howland in 1836, the, the boat was lost, not an, not an uncommon uh, occurrence. In 1845, Isaac John Sanford on board Champion died of mortification, uh, followed in 1850 by John Brayton on Isabella dying of excitement. Uh, Thomas Barnes on Inga was killed by South Sea Islanders. Uh, Thomas Peabody on Morea shot himself. Uh, Archibald Mellon on Junior was shot by his crew. So there were plenty of ways um, that I could, I could not come back uh, and not make good on the loan. What, what, makes this, what makes this equity side uh, so appealing to you, ma'am? Because I, I understand the upside, but I'm also a little bit worried that I'm, I'm going to lose all of my life and, and you're going to lose all of your money. So is there anything that you'd like sort of along, along with the equity? If you could, you would, split, you would share the risk. You would syndicate to others, and I guess. I, yeah. don't know, I don't know how else. I don't know if I'd ever... I wouldn't have $30,000 in 1850, probably. <laughs> right. There, so there may, so be, there may be a capital constraint not yeah. on the borrower side, but on the lender side. Right. And so syndicating with others is part of it. Um, there's a hand in the back. Yep. Insurance. What sort of insurance, sir? Well, you could have life insurance on the captain or property insurance on the vessel. Yep. With, with insurance and Sorry, can everybody hear me? I was just saying insurance, not only on the captain, on the skipper, but uh, on the vessel itself. Yeah, life insurance at the time was not a particularly uh, well-developed industry for, for whaling captains, uh, who had a, a variety of ways to go. Um, and there was also a problem with, you can insure the vessel, but the vessel isn't actually the expensive part of the voyage. So if you look at the, sort of optimal returns that these guys were, were aiming for and, and probably selling for, they were saying, we're gonna come back with 120, 150, you know, $250,000. And so you can't insure that lost cargo that would have been lost because, okay, Essex is a year into its voyage when it sunk, but let's say I was sunk on the homeward uh, trip and whale oil was at a peak and I had everything that I'd wanted uh, out there. So insurance is a partial solution, but it's not a, not a complete solution. Is there anybody else that has an idea about how you can mitigate your risk? Because I, I, I agree that, there, that there's a, a very appealing side, um, which is the equity and the upside, and that, okay, you take the, the chance that I'm sunk, but you're also potentially benefiting, uh, and, and that is the sort of risk that you're interested in. Sir? I guess my question is, do you have more than one boat? Do I have more than one boat? Or do you know have, do you have friends who might be going out about the same time? Because yeah. I'm a little leery about putting $30,000 in your boat, but if there were three or four other boats, I might be able to play the odds a little bit. Yeah. Um, you also have a little bit of a risk, and I, I don't mean this um, quite as flippantly as it may sound, you have a little bit of a risk in me. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just the case that I might die, I also might be terrible at whaling. And so I disappear with $30,000 for three years, let's say I keep at it, right? The most dangerous person is the idiot who keeps trying. Um, and I keep going, I keep going, and I'm gone for seven years now. And your money is, is nowhere um, to be found. There's another problem with the, the debt side of this. I'm not gonna be able to pay monthly or quarterly or even annually while I'm gone. So all of your payoff is going to be at the back end 
which makes equity a little bit more um, reasonable. You had mentioned secondary markets uh, for potentially futures uh, in, in the oil business. There's a little bit that happens later on, a secondary market for shares of equity in voyages, but it's not particularly well developed. So you're locked up, to use a contemporary term, for as long as the ship um, is at sea. Is there anything about the enterprise itself that makes it particularly appealing to you? Is there anybody that says, if I can get a slice of this, I want it? I'll tell you that you know, the, returns on, um, the returns on whaling voyages of the time, in 1850, annual rates of return you know, for, for a, a manufacturing concern, about 15%, right? That's the mean uh, across, the, across the country. New Bedford whaling, 15 to call it 25%. That's, that's a pretty good return uh, at the time. That declines steadily until we hit the 1870s uh, when whaling really falls off uh, a cliff and has all sorts of trouble with Arctic ice, uh, struggles to recover from the Confederate raiders, uh, and struggles to recover from all of the other, the other things that are coming online, most notably petroleum, which, um, which we'll get to in just a moment. Now that I'm going to see, right, so I have an, I have an equity side, maybe uh, you've invested in a variety of different folks who are going out, maybe you've gotten some other people to, to co-invest with you, I've got to go and I've got to find a crew. Those of you that read the case study, those of you that have read Moby Dick, those of you that have any idea about sailing, about voyaging, you know that when you go offshore, it gets a little bit scary, right? This is, this is a time when you are a large ocean, you are, sorry, you are in a large ocean, you are in a small ship, and you will eventually be in a smaller boat to go after uh, a sperm whale or a right whale. What do you think are the advantages of the lay system? So the lay system was involved with a share of the final proceeds of the voyage. What do we, what, what, yep, in the back. You only get paid if you're successful. Only get paid if you're successful. And when you say you, what do you mean? Yeah, so the captain is at a particularly short lay, so a short lay was a good thing. A long lay was, well, perhaps not a bad thing. It was maybe the best option that you could get. But when you say you, do you mean the individuals? Yeah. Okay. Is there anybody that has a slightly different take? It's the whole of the crew. It's not that the individual is pulling on the oar for themselves although that is valuable. It's that the individual is pulling on the oar for that whaleboat. So the six or seven men who are in it are then contributing to the four or five boats that are on the ship, and so the crew of 30 is all of a sudden aligned with their incentives. How are those incentives aligned from, let's say, the harpoon in the whale all the way back to the owner in New Bedford? Let's see if we can tease this out as we go. Ma'am? Well, I mean, I see a problem. If somebody, if somebody, yeah? If the guys in the boat with the harpoon don't like the captain and they're getting 1 777th, yeah. and the captain's getting 1 50th, like, I don't know. That's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be the captain. They, they, they might want to kill me and to bring it all back and get more for themselves. So there's an issue with that because you show up in Nantucket Harbor and you say, I'm, I'm sorry, the captain's dead. Could we please have his share? <laughs> what are you, the equity investor in the voyage, going to say to them? What happened to the captain? Yes, and you're probably not going to do it. So the, there were um, US, uh, not, there were sort of customs, customs officials that were, that were overseas, so consuls in, in various ports of call, and they had to go through this. You're not just going to say it to the group as a whole. You're going to separate the group into individual rooms. You're going to have your deputy consuls do the interrogation. And you're going to say, what happened to the captain? And I can guarantee that 30 people, well, now 29, on a whale ship are not going to be able to keep their story straight. And so it's going to come out that the harpoon didn't end up in the whale. The harpoon ended up in, in the captain's chest. So there were some examples of mutiny. They tended not to be 
the sort of um, mutiny for commercial gain uh, that you may see in other parts of the world. It's, it's called baratry, actually. So what kind of people do you find that are willing to work for little or no money unless they're successful and be gone for three years and ostensibly all they're getting is food and some kind of shelter? Yeah. So These prisoners? No, not at all. These, these, were, um, these were people who were going to ascend to the highest positions in society on Nantucket, on Martha's Vineyard, in New Bedford, Sag Harbor, um, some, in, some in Rhode Island, and they were brought up in a culture that prioritized whaling as a, a way of life and as a way to, to make not only a name uh, for yourself, but, but also for your family. And you see a lot of very interesting ties that stretch within uh, the Nantucket community and then also uh, over to New Bedford. One of the things that we found in writing this case study is that though sperm whaling starts theoretically with Christopher Hussey in 1712 being blown offshore into a pot of whales, it then moves quickly by the 1830s to New Bedford. So the sandbar um, off of the harbor and you have the camel that's floating. So are you familiar with the camel that floated the whale ships across? That's ingenious, but it's not terribly practical. Um, New Bedford doesn't have any real geographic advantages. It's a very good harbor, but it's not the best harbor on the East Coast. Uh, what it did have was it had religious ties. So there were many Quaker families on Nantucket who had maintained a correspondence and also a relationship with Quaker families in New Bedford. And what you see, and I think what uh, Professor Dotarive is going to talk about a little bit with the Spermacetti Trust, is that religious ties can be very powerful as motivators for economic activity. So the Quakers on Nantucket partnered with the Quakers in New Bedford. And we have some indication that this is particularly true because in the 1820s, there's a schism in the Society of Friends in New Bedford. And some families end up remaining within the church and some families end up going to other churches. And if you look at the way in which the agents and captains and counting houses and insurance agencies do business, there is a Society of Friends group and there is a not Society of Friends group. And these are mostly Unitarians and Congregationalists. A few of them go all the way um, to Episcopalian. So there are, some, there are some differences that you see within those groups. I, I didn't, however, get to the, the biggest motivation for a lot of these people who are gonna go, out, gonna go out to sea. If you have a successful voyage as a third mate, what are you looking for the next time? Second mate. And if you think about the way in which the lays were set up, on the same voyage where, let's say, a third mate was at a 30th, a 40th, a 50th, the second mate may have been at a 20th, first mate was at a 15th, and the cap captain could be as, as short a lay as the seventh, and that's just of the voyage for his services. He may also, in a, an early uh, variant of carried interest, have been an owner of the voyage. So in addition to being compensated for his services on the voyage, he may, or I guess in this case, I may, have put up some of the $30,000 uh, myself, in which case I'm paid out of a slightly different pot of money, but it's basically um, the same. Do you see any, any other problems beyond the, the baratry mutiny, um, me ending up with a harpoon in my chest, uh, of, the, of the lay system? What are the incentives for the captain to bring all of the crew home? Right, so the, so the captain says we sail at noon. Turns out that the captain actually sails at nine in the morning. We spent six years in the Navy. I know how sober sailors are at nine o'clock in the morning, right? You just, you miss the last, you miss the last boat back to uh, Nantucket. And you have, uh, then the captain is able to take that lay uh, for himself. The captain is also in some cases obliged to forward money. So there is a, basically an advance on your eventual uh, compensation. That presents an alternate incentive. So the first port of call in the, in the Canaries or in uh, Chile or, or wherever you happen to be, all of a sudden I don't, I don't come back um, as, the, as the, you know, not, probably not one of the mates because I'm on my way, but as an able-bodied seaman I, I don't come back and then the, the captain is stuck with that money having gone out, 
On the other hand, the captain also tended to have two or three chests full of warm clothing, which would become useful in the Arctic, and he didn't tell anybody to bring any warm clothing. So all of a sudden, my, um, my wool sweater that you know, I bought at Murray's for $150, I can now sell for $400. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's that uh, incentive as I'm, a, as, as I'm a captain. As we think about the incentives being aligned from the harpoon, let's say, all the way back to New Bedford, I'll just, I'll just lay it out as, as quickly um, as I can. The, the five or six guys in the small boat are all only going to benefit if that whale is killed and towed back to the whale ship. They're then only going to benefit if they are able to fight off the sharks that would show up as soon as a bloody whale showed up next to a whale ship. They are going to ladle out the case from the head if it's a sperm whale. They're going to separate the head uh, if it's a right whale or another uh, filter feeder and extract the whale bone. And then they're going to unwind uh, the strips, cut them into uh, horse strips and then, and then Bible leaves and then render them in a triworks uh, at sea, which presented its own difficulty. And the number of whale ships that burned uh, is, is significantly higher than the number of whale ships that were struck by a whale. So this is a, this is a risky venture from the very beginning uh, to the very end. There are a few other things that we see aligning incentives as you go from the harpoon all the way back to the piers. The agent, so the agent is the one, and this is really more of a New Bedford innovation than it is a Nantucket innovation. The agent is the one that pooled all of your money, right? He took the finest citizens in the town, got a little bit from each one of them, and then distributed those funds to different uh, whaling captains as they were going. And if he did it well, he would have voyages returning, if not every month, then as close to it as possible so that there is a ready stream of funding coming in, even as the agent is allocating more funds to voyages going out. But the agent has a particular problem because so much is resting on the captain. And so the agent would give advice to captains as they went. And in, uh, in the Harvard Business School historical collections uh, is Charles Morgan's letter book. So the Charles W. Morgan is the whale ship that came to Nantucket three summers ago, Two, wh whenever it was, it's, it's now down at Mystic. Um, and Charles W. Morgan is, is writing to uh, a gentleman named George Dexter, who's, who's a master of the ship Condor. As you have now taken the responsible station of master of a ship and are a young man, you will permit me to offer some advice. The greatest difficulty I have observed with young masters is either too great indulgence or too great severity towards their crew. Discipline must be effectual, be administered with a steady hand, especially among sailors, and there is no station which requires more guard over the temper than that of a master of a ship. And on your first voyage depends, in a great measure, your future success in life. Let me then beg of you to keep a strict watch over the moral conduct of your crew, never permit your authority to be abused or set it not, but at the same time, never to use undue severity yourself or permit it in your officers. I have a real confidence in you, and I trust you will not feel hurt at my giving advice, which I feel it my duty to offer you. A number of the people who have been sitting through this coming of managerial capitalism class in the second year of Harvard Business School fancy themselves to be founders of uh, the next big thing. They're going to go out, they're going to start uh, Facebook, they're going to start Snapchat, they're going to start, some of them have, um, Cattle and, and Rent the Runway and, and a variety of others. This is pretty good advice for the founder of a company. And if you look at some of the coverage that has been uh, recently broadcast about a company like Uber, about a company like Tesla, about some of the startups that have been uh, in trouble with the, the Me Too movement, some of the suits that have been filed against venture capital firms, uh, you would see that this is good advice and it's from 1834. These are highly risky ventures. These are highly risky voyages. And these are voyages that are going to go on for quite a while, three to five years. That's not dissimilar to the lockup period for a venture capital firm. They might be five to seven years, but 
you're not going to get your money before that. You might have access to a secondary market if it's a venture capital investment, but you're going to have a pretty hefty haircut to get your money out early. There was no such option for these whaling voyages. A few other things that the, the agents were able to do as um, these voyages were underway. Every now and again, they would call at Honolulu or San Francisco and get new information about prices. So that could drive some of their product selection. There are instances of captains getting information that the price of you know, whale oil is X and the price of bone is Y, and so they throw over the bone to get more whale oil or vice versa. Um, there were also opportunities at sea for a GAM, mostly dancing in the forecastle, uh, but also potentially the exchange of information. And Aiken and Swift, uh, no relation, gave a particular set of coded communication books, one of which survives in Houghton Library, to their uh, captains coming out, of, coming out of New Bedford. This book is given into your charge with the full understanding that all its contents will be kept by you in the strictest confidence and that you will make it a point of honor not to communicate any of its contents to anyone whatever, directly or indirectly, or let anyone get them in any way except the captains of our ships. And so one of the things that you see the agents controlling is the intellectual property. This is the idea that the captain knows what he's doing when at sea, but he may need some guidance uh, as to where to go in order to find the most effective whales. You have two other things uh, that I'll mention and then uh, go through uh, a, bit of a bit of a slide deck that lays out some of the, the conclusions that we've reached. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask people, is there anything that you see in this system that doesn't survive into the modern venture capital economy? And is there anything in the modern venture capital economy that you don't see in this system? So I'd like you to be thinking about those questions um, as, you, as you move forward. One of the things that happens in uh, this economy is that people do progress from cabin boy to master. And when you are the master of a ship and you have done well, you can come back to Nantucket, you can come back to Edgartown, you can come back to New Bedford, and you can build yourself a big house. And you can do so in a prominent location. And so you have a financial reward that comes from that professional advancement, but you also have a societal reward that comes from that advancement. And that's a little bit analogous to some of the startup uh, buzz that may be surrounding some of the venture capital economy of today. And then the last thing I'll point out um, is that James uh, and I were talking about this last night uh, at the McCausland's. Thank you uh, to the McCausland's in absentia for hosting last night. It was, uh, it was wonderful. Nantucket was the first island that we know of in America to pay someone to come and whale here. And so what James and I are hoping uh, will happen is that somewhere the contract with James Loper in 1672 or the contract with Ichabod Paddock in 1690 exists. And the way in which New Bedford overtook Nantucket as the whaling capital of the world should not obscure the role that Nantucket played in starting the industry. And in starting the industry, Nantucket was first really in this idea of the lay system. Part of what may come out of the lay system is the notion of stock options. That you are paid in risky ventures only when we know the venture to be a success. So the vesting period for a whaling voyage is the voyage itself. And the only claim that you have is then on what is functionally the free cash flow of the voyage after the oil and the bone have been sold on. And so the question is, where does this lay system come from? And I've hypothesized uh, a few things, and I'm, I'm hopeful that other folks um, will, will do a little more work, and, and maybe we can find this. Whales were viewed both by the Wampanoags and also by early European settlers as a community resource. They were shared largely equally, and it seems that the early whalers would bring back a whale, or if it was, was found to be dead, they would tow it back to shore and it would be divided among the community. So it wasn't as though there was a wage paid to someone for the time that they spent whaling. The wage was itself in the whale. And there is also an idea um, that is, has come out of a little bit of 
this idea of religious communities, that uh, the Quakers were particularly excited about a share of a shared venture. Not a wage, not a salary, but a share of a shared venture, even if they were uh, disproportionate shares um, along the way. So those are the, those are the things that I've got to say uh, about the case study. I've got a few slides, and then we'll return to that question of what do you see in this economy that hasn't survived into the current economy, and what do you see in the current economy that isn't necessarily present back in the 19th century. Um, this is a very common image in the advertising of whaling goods. So this is uh, Mitchell and Crowsdale were uh, a company in Pennsylvania. They were a general goods store. And it's not entirely clear to me that this image would make you want to buy uh, candles and, and rice. Um, but if it, if it does, uh, so much the better. You see this uh, used by Nye Lubricants, which is a New Bedford company that made, uh, well, started in the whale oil business and eventually made specialty synthetic oils for the space shuttle and, and for the, the Air Force. You see them using a variant of this image uh, right up until the 1980s. So I've got a different paper uh, on that when you, when you get bored of this one. The financial characteristics of a whaling voyage are very interesting. This is the pursuit not only of a whale's tail, but also the long tail. If you look at the expected annualized return, you're almost at 20%. But you have a wide variety of ways to lose all of your money. You have a relatively normal distribution, and then you have an enormously long tail all the way out here. And you had basically a third of a chance of losing your capital. So not only would you not have any equity on the upside, you wouldn't have anything with which to repay your debts, in which case I may not have come back uh, to Nantucket, may have decided to, to go elsewhere. Um, these, are, these are slightly idealized, uh, but they make sense as we go. The operational characteristics of a whaling voyage have largely been teased out in our discussion today. Sometimes you find the whales, many times you didn't. Even when you did find them, they weren't especially willing to cooperate. And sometimes they actually were really uncooperative and tried to kill you. Uh, local decisions definitely counted. The captain and even the captain's designated authorities, so the mates that were in the whale boats, had to make good decisions. That's also part of their professional advancement. If you can command a small unit, you may be able to command a larger unit. That's been uh, tried and true in the United States Marine Corps and, and other uh, service branches as a, as a way of promotion. Good equipment counts. One of the things um, that Baker Library at, at Harvard purchased when I was working on this were the accounts of a Nantucket blacksmith and the sheer quantity of harpoons made on this island and in New Bedford was absolutely astounding. You know, seven, eight, nine hundred, even a thousand harpoon heads going on a single voyage with even more uh, harpoon shafts to go with it. And as we know, single flu and then double flu and then improved temple design, you had real technological innovation making what was a risky venture, maybe not safer, but potentially less risky because the harpoon would not, um, would not pull out. There is huge key man risk in the, in the captain. The captain was responsible not only for operating the vessel, but also largely for selecting the crew with which he would go for three to five years. There is a long horizon to return. You don't have a whole lot of sense of how you're doing, right? There aren't quarterly board meetings where you can go over sales figures. Um, and if there were, they would get to Nantucket six months after the meeting had been held. And uh, it's not entirely clear that your competitors hadn't read the mail as it, as it went through there. Um, you also had little idea of, even if you knew how much you had in the hold, how much it was going to be worth when you got back to, when you got back to shore. And finally, uh, as mentioned, it's, it's dangerous. Bank debt, you were right on. Bank debt is not a great option. Uh, you suffer the chance of a big loss, all of it, uh, and, and then nothing comes back. And, and I can collateralize, I can't collateralize $30,000. I can collateralize some of it, but not nearly enough to make it worthwhile. Corporate organizations were tried, largely in Connecticut and Rhode Island, uh, and also on the Hudson River, uh, of all places, where I think towns saw what money was being made by New Bedford and what money was being made by 
Nantucket. And they said, huh, we can do that. And so they had a board of directors and they built ships and they went and found it. But they were missing. They were missing a key component of what you needed to be a successful whaler, which was having been a successful whaler uh, in the past. You know, failure was, failure was not a great training ground for promotion. And if you were willing to go to work for one of these corporations, it's probable that you were not in demand by one of the Nantucket voyages or one of the New Bedford uh, agents. You also have uh, some of the principal agent risk uh, mitigation strategies where they keep a lot of the decisions centralized, where in a whaling voyage, you want to have the decision made as close to the whale as possible because that's where you're actually going to get your resources. The agent intermediary of particularly the New Bedford counting houses, although there were some out here, the capital source is pretty broad. You know, even rich blacksmiths in New Bedford were able to invest along with their agent friends. Uh, you can fit the financing to the cycle and to the market so that you allocate some financing to an Atlantic right whale voyage, some financing to a South Atlantic sperm whale voyage, and some to uh, a seven year uh, Pacific sperm whaling voyage. Later on, of course, you would have agents that were organizing voyages to the Arctic where they anticipated that the ship would actually get stuck in the ice for a season and then be able to whale early on. Organizes the voyage and pushes the decision down. This is where, this is where you see the biggest combination of the whaling agent and the modern venture capital firm. Spreads the risk among the owners. So in that case, it would be largely the limited partners of uh, a venture capital firm, and then has an obligation to report, monitor, and then oversee the operations. We would think of that in modern parlance as taking a board seat, perhaps. Board seats weren't available on a whaling voyage, right? You didn't travel with a supernumerary, so you had to pick the captain uh, especially well. Average profits of the top 29 agents, this all comes out of a National Bureau of Economic Research study called In Pursuit of Leviathan that was written back in the 90s. Uh, used copy goes for about $600 on uh, Amazon. You can download all of the PDFs from the NBER website. Uh, and if you're struggling to sleep at night, I suggest you do that. Um, the average profits are decent. Decent, you see a semi-normal distribution. Again, a, a large tail here, and we'll talk a little bit about Gideon Allen in just a moment. Uh, and the way they picked these 29 is they had more than 40 voyages out of New Bedford with good data. So some of the voyages that these agents underwrote, uh, the, the information has, has been lost. You see Gideon Allen and Son uh, all the way there, averaging over about 30 years, a 60% return. That's, that's spectacular. And if you go to New Bedford and, and see the house that Gideon Allen built, you'll see where uh, a lot of that money went. You have uh, John Knowles, and then you have David Green and company that over uh, the 20 years that they had data for them, loses money. Uh, on, on average. So this is the structure of, of a whaling voyage. The, the owners would provide the capital, the agent would pool that capital and then allocate it to the captains. They would have anywhere from three to 12 voyages underway, depending on the size of the agent. And then the crew is underneath the captain, but their incentive as they pursue these whales is very clearly aligned with the owners because they're all getting a share of these at the bottom. And that's one of the things that's most attractive about this venture financing is that the risk and the reward are shared by all those who are involved along the way. If you think about the risk mitigation that's involved as well, excusing mutiny and excusing perhaps the sinking of a whale ship the risk has been mitigated to the extent that it, that it can be. Uh, this looks an awful lot like the venture capital structure of today, where limited partners provide uh, funding. The venture capitalists pool that funding as the general partners. They select the entrepreneurs in whom they're going to invest, and the entrepreneurs run their company. If you think about most startups, you may have a salary, but you're going to be paid in stock options. And so your payoff is going to come when we know that this is a successful venture. That doesn't necessarily mean that you go public, could mean that you're bought out by a growth equity company, that you are bought out by a strategic competitor, but that's when you're going to get uh, the free cash flow allocated to those that are still out there. 
And of course, what are all venture capitalists in pursuit of? They're all in pursuit of unicorns, those companies over a billion dollars within a decade. Yes, sir. Correct. So a lot of these ships were built in uh, Marion and, and Mattapoisett. Some of them were built up uh, on the North Shore of Boston in uh, Medford and, and some in, in Boston itself. The ships were available for a long period of time. So there were some that went on 20 voyages. There were some that went on only a, a few voyages before they became um, basically unrefittable, un, uh, I guess is, is the way to describe it. But when Tom and I were writing this case, we thought, what is the analogy to the ship? And we really thought that's the office space. That's something that you have to pay cash to rent. That's something that you use. And a better whale ship is going to be better for whaling, but it's not actually the thing that's going to be key to the success. And so the whale ships were part of the outfitting cost, but a lot of the outfitting cost was laying in provisions, laying in uh, the staves for the barrels, laying in the harpoons and the shafts and, and all the rest of it, which were the actual tools of the whaling trade, whereas the whale ship was the place where you did it. Does that, does that make sense? Yep. Um, this is a stylized whaling payoff structure, um, and you see that it fits quite well with what we saw earlier on. There's a low probability of a, of a small gain. Um, you have to be comfortable with a, a total loss. And 6% of the voyages did not return. 12% um, of sailors setting out on whaling ships from Nantucket died before they, before they got back. Um, these are the figures gathered by, by Davis, Gallman, and Gleiter in that uh, NBER survey. So that's a, that's a really risky venture, right? That's not your name appears on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. That's a really risky venture. Um, and part of it is also potentially involved in the allure. One of the things that uh, David Moment, who is a professor at Harvard Business School, said when he wrote really the first serious treatment of the economic history was, the glamour of the American whale fishery has tended to obscure its economic outlines and significance. And he also said that most of what people have paid attention to ends at the piers. So the sexy part, if you will, of whaling is the time at sea. Is the finding the whales, is the lowering the boats, is the stove boat or a dead whale, all of the things that you imagine uh, to be celebrated. What's less well understood and what some people are beginning to work on is the distribution networks that were in place for whalebone, that were in place for sperm, uh, spermaceti candles. We'll hear more about an, an early one of those uh, next. And in addition to finding Ichabod uh, and the, the other contracts, uh, if any of you are interested in those distribution networks, I can, I can point you in the right direction. This is very similar to a stylized VC payoff structure. And this is, this is taken from a course on the history of venture capital uh, that Tom taught with a guy named Felda Hardeman, who's been involved at, at Highland Capital for many years. And 55% of Bessemer Venture Partners' investments lose some money. Over a quarter lost the entire investment. So this is current as of 2015. I, I, I don't know that the numbers are that different uh, at the moment. And you can see the pay puzzle, uh, just as you're, as you're trying to read this. It seems incredible that an intelligent, active young American should pass through four years of labor, not to mention dangers from both sea and monster, separated from family and country at the rate of $5.22 per month, which was the average pay of one of the, the working folks um, on the on the boat, but they did, but they did. And that, that has to do with the allure of, of the big payday. This is the first American economy that goes from our shores to other parts of the world. You have the early establishment of the American consul system that I mentioned. You have communication structures that are in place. And in 1850, we had over 70% of the whale ships at sea flying an American flag. These are the problems that have been uh, at least partially solved. So the financing risk, principal agent issues, the incentives are aligned so that the agent and the captain don't have differing incentives and there isn't the ideal uh, of absconding. Moral hazard, with the exception of those who are willing to kill me, um, has largely been addressed. And the organization hierarchy and management structures all bake in through the compensation an idea that we are in this together, we are in this for a while, and we are in this far from home. 
so we better be coordinated uh, as we go. Looking at the annualized percentage returns that I mentioned earlier, it compares favorably with manufacturing in 1850. By 1870, you can see that manufacturing has taken off substantially. Those of you who have been in New Bedford uh, know that many of the mills that were built in New Bedford are still standing. Not all of them are full. Um, and those were built with whaling money. Those of you who invested in Berkshire Hathaway a long time ago, uh, I congratulate you. You will know that uh, Berkshire was, I'm sorry, Berkshire Hathaway was the descendant of a mill that Warren Buffett bought for uh, the tax loss carry forwards. So the early American global economy lives on in, in a different sort of, of investing uh, growth. You can see that manufacturing has done quite well um, by 1870. So I asked if there anything in the 1850s, 1860s that doesn't survive to the present day, and if there's anything you see in the present day VC economy that you didn't see back then. Anybody have any ideas on that? Sir, in the back? Yeah. Just doesn't happen. On the other side, I would say there's no outsourcing that's taken place in the Nantucket environment, in the whaling environment. No outsourcing. You couldn't outsource the guys who are going to go on the boat to go after the whale. You couldn't right. find another company. So there's no outsourcing, which is a prevalent thing of venture capital today. Yeah. And the, uh, the idea of having contractors, you would have a specialized outfitter, a ship's chandler here, but you would buy from them products you wouldn't necessarily take them uh, with you as, as consultants or contractors as you, as you did that. Yeah. I will tell you, when I did this last summer at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, there was an ongoing board fight at, um, I think it was Benchmark. Benchmark wanted Travis Kalanick gone at Uber, and they said, we simply did not know what was going on within the company as their defense. And again, I find that very hard to believe, in the 1850s, you had no way to know what was going on. Uh, in the present economy, it's, uh, it's particularly interesting. Any other things? Okay. Um, were they just rented or were they bought? Both. So there were agents that owned their own ships and then allocated them to different voyages. And then there were consortiums that owned whaling ships and rented them out to the individual voyages as they went. And that goes back to the question about how long would a whale ship be worthwhile? If it had been a very long voyage, you had to spend basically a replacement cost to get it refitted, and it might be cheaper to buy the latest model uh, and have a new ship. So that was another big decision that the agent and the captain had to make together, sort of like where do we buy real estate so that we, or sorry, where do we rent real estate so that we look like we know what we're doing and now you know why uh, Four Point Channel is the place to be in Boston, because it's lofty. Yes, sir? This may be a stupid question, but have you ever made a comparison with all of this history where whale oil ran the world for a while until they discovered oil in Pennsylvania? Yep. To not the major oil companies out in the, the offshore and so forth, but to the independent oil man in America and the risk he's taking and wildcatting, where about one out of 10 come in. Have you ever did a, done a comparison about the risk and so forth? Not so much the exact kind of facts, but on the final basis of uh, return and, and, and so forth. I mean, so the, the economic side of it yeah. has been done for uh, the whaling industry by, by the, the folks at the NBER. Right. There are sort of regional histories of what you might call independent producers or wildcatters, depending on how you feel about them. Um, there is a professor at the University of Illinois who is writing a book about the transition from whale oil to petroleum. Um, she presented last year at the Whaling Museum, and I think she's touching on a lot of those questions. What is this entrepreneurial spirit, high risk, high reward, and how does it compare between going to sea and going to Titusville or Texas or, or wherever you end up. I should wait and re read that book when it comes out. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Jamie, Jamie Jones is her name. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the back, sir? Yeah. 
Yeah. Nepotism was the, uh, sorry, Who yes. The, all right, so also they took care, they also took care of the families. Yes. And, and, it, and that is part of the religion too. Other Quakers took care of other Quakers' families also on these voyages because they're gone for three years, they've got a wife and they've got children. Yeah. Part of what you would need to do as a whaling captain is figure out how your family was going to live while you were gone. And in some cases, you would have to take out loans. In other cases, you could rely on your family members to look after your family. And then when you got back, you would build a plenty big house on Main Street for you, your sister, and your, and your other sister. Um, yeah, the, the shipping lists are, there are lots of knolls, there are lots of roches, there are lots of cranes on Martha's Vineyard. So it's not clear exactly what the relationships are, but if you didn't have your own son on your ship, you may have your son on another agent, uh, sorry, another captain within the same agent group's ship. Um, there's a fascinating piece of research done about rates of flogging, which was legal until 1850, on whale ships. And they found that captains who took their wives on these whaling voyages flogged less than those who didn't take their wives. And so there's the question, is it the presence of the wife that prevents the flogging? Or is it the kind of guy who would bring his wife wouldn't be flogging in the first place? Um, and if you're, uh, if you're interested, I need to put in a plug for my, my first uh, Massachusetts Historical Society. I was an intern at the Martha's Vineyard Historical Society. And there is a great website about Laura Jernigan, who was a six-year-old girl who went on a whaling voyage with her father. And she kept a diary. And so they've digitized the diary and put it online. And it gives a very different example of life on a ship uh, than we have from Melville uh, and from others. So families were involved. They were not always taken to sea, but they were always involved. Sir. Many of the younger members of the crew didn't have families. If you were what would be known as an officer of the boat, so one of the mates, you would probably have a provision in your contract for your descendants, but not, uh, not invariably. And so there are examples, again, these, these consuls far from home, of having to decide how the, the shares are distributed after the death uh, of a crew member uh, before they got home. But I think there isn't a, a single answer for, for that question. If you were the captain, then it would certainly go uh, to your family because you were a, a principal of the voyage, as it were, but, um, but not guaranteed. Um, a few more ideas, and then I, I just have one to wrap up. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is there, is there some reason that it seems to doesn't carry exactly on a percentage basis, but it comes pretty close? The system that was in place 150 or 200 years ago is almost the similar to the system that's in place today and sharing of equity in these historic firms? Yeah, so the, the question of how you allocate those percentages is one that Tom and I want to spend a little more time looking at and the data set from uh, NBER should, should help. We're trying to get our hands on it. All of the authors uh, have passed away. What's most striking is that those officers of the voyage, so the captain, the first, second, and in some cases, third mates, have what you would imagine to be an officer's share of the voyage. And then the tail goes uh, a lot further, and some cabin boys uh, shipped for just, just slops. Um, and a, a roof over their heads, which is not dissimilar to an unpaid intern of today, simply getting a, a line on their resume. Um, I think it comes down to this idea that the captain is the person for the voyage, and the voyage is inseparable from the person running it, which is largely how we have mythologized founders of, of companies today. Um, 
One of the distinctions that I have noticed and that has been brought up when this is taught at Harvard Business School is any company that was looking to raise more money and only had one venture capital firm backing it would struggle, would struggle mightily. But almost all voyages leaving from Nantucket and New Bedford were backed by a single agent. So the modern venture capital economy wants many venture capital firms to invest in a single startup. The whaling industry basically prevented more than one agent from organizing a voyage because they didn't want the conflicting uh, returns. One of the other things we've found, and this goes back to the advice from, from Charles Morgan, is one of the easiest ways to not be a whaling captain is to fail as a whaling captain. That doesn't seem to be the case with founders today, right? <laughs> one, of the, one of the ways to, to get financing is to have a, a spectacular failure that gets you lots of coverage, uh, and then you can go on and, and have a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth venture um, as, as you go. And I know some folks that have, that have tried that. Uh, the failure is not fun, but the, the dead cat bounce is, is pretty spectacular at times. Um, any, any other ideas? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Yeah, so the, so the contracts, the, the lay systems, were legally enforceable documents. Um, it's one of the reasons, actually, that this is a particularly well understood industry of the 1850s, is because every time you returned to New Bedford, you had to fill out your customs form. And so those exist, and uh, during the 30s, one of the things that the old Dartmouth Historical Society and the Kendall Whaling Museum got were historians from the New Deal who came and did a lot of the work with those documents. So that regulation was a reporting regulation. You had to say how much you were bringing back, and that has allowed us to do um, the work that we've done. You also had to say what the percentages for the, the shipping lists were for the, for the crew, because those were legally enforceable documents. I've mentioned the consuls that had to mediate disputes uh, overseas, and that was, that was about it. Um, there were no... OSHA. No OSHA. No OSHA. Um, no OSHA and no, um, no idea of you know, filing a, a grievance with the shop steward. I can, I can tell you how that would go. Um, there was, however, the idea that if you were known as a flogging captain, you might not get a crew for your next voyage. And so if you didn't strike that balance between being firm but not unfair or disciplined but not disciplining, then you might not have a, a future voyage. And many of these were, were looking at, at five and seven and, and ten voyages uh, apiece. There's a, a guy that went on 20 voyages uh, as a whale ship captain. I don't know how that worked. But. They had, they had some rights, but they were very rare. A, a lawsuit by a crew member is almost unheard of because, I, I mean, I hesitate to say that all Quakers are good people, but, but there, was a, there was a fairness and uh, sticking to your word that was part of the community, and it was part of the community because of the, the religious traditions, uh, as well as the idea, I think, that if you got the reputation as an agent or a captain that didn't pay your share, that could be worse than flogging. So you want to have a crew that signs up with you uh, the next time, and there's an incentive to be a, a, a good person as you go. Sir, in the back, and then I, I think we've got to wrap up. Yeah, so agents, agents ended up having a wide variety of connections within the New Bedford economy especially, and they were largely financial connections. They would be focused on operating their whaling ventures, but they would invest in the mills that were going up. They would invest in the banks that were started. They would invest in the insurance companies that came along. Um, the Knowles family was involved in the, in the yarn industry uh, very early on, and I think one of the things you see in any economy that has a central industry or any economic region 
is that they have to do a lot of things to keep that economy going uh, in that regional area. And so while they got their money from whaling, it didn't stay in whaling. Uh, and New Bedford ended up in the, in the industrial situation uh, that it was you know, up until the 50s and 60s.